Thanks everybody for coming. I know this was a, uh, a, a slot in the conference that was hard to pick, choose and we appreciate you coming to this one. Um, <laughs> my name is Michael Manella. You already know about me, so we'll just skip over this. I will let you, uh, my co-presenter introduce himself though. Hi, uh, my name is Mahmoud Benassin. Uh, I work for Pivotal uh, as a member of the Spring Batch team. Uh, can you go back, Michael? Yeah. <laughs> so I have the privilege to work closely with Michael on Spring Batch on a daily basis. Um, I also run a couple of open source projects that you can find uh, at jeasy.org. Um, you can find me on GitHub and Twitter, so please feel free to reach out. Uh, this is my first talk at Spring One platform, so I'm very happy and excited to be part of this uh, great event. Cool. Uh, a little selfless or uh, selfish promotion. Um, I'm on a podcast called Offheap, uh, JavaOffheap.com. Uh, it's a pundit podcast, so if you want to hear uh, a bunch of people hanging out in a bar talking about what's going on in the JVM, uh, you know, Oracle via Google, um, what's going on with Linus Torvalds and the latest stuff there, uh, check us out. Like I said, javaoffheap.com, as well as I also have a book on Batch coming out later this year uh, from APRESS. It'll be uh, uh, the Definitive Guide to Spring Batch. It's uh, basically my previous book updated for all the Spring Boot stuff. Um, so check that out later this year. All of the slides and demos are out on GitHub. So everything you see here today, you'll be able to download, play with, uh, uh, et cetera. Uh, I'll, wait for, I'll wait for the pictures on this one. Cameras, 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 cameras. Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> All right. Please ask questions when you have them. Uh, I don't want you to have to wait till the end and forget. And frankly, I'd rather make sure you get what you need out of this session than us talk at you for the next 70 minutes. Quick lay of the land. Um, I'm assuming since this is spring one, everybody's familiar with spring. Is that to the case? Yes, good. Uh, how many people have used spring batch? Awesome. Cool. Uh, cool. Um, so just like before, this is going to be the most exciting talk you've heard all week long, because we're going to talk all about batch processing. <laughs> um, while it, you know, it, it has that stigma of being boring and whatnot. I personally find it as one of the more interesting areas of, of uh, computer science. Not many people build a website that, that handles the volumes that most batch processes do every day. Um, there's some really interesting challenges within batch processing that, that you just don't get in most other areas. Um, and we're going to look at uh, ways of handling some of those today. Um, but the, the concept goes all the way back to literally the beginning of computing. Um, Batch processing is really about the efficient use of resources, though. Uh, you know, you hear people talk about streaming data and uh, reactive and all these kinds of things, um, real-time processing. Those are great for speed and, and low latency, but if you're looking for using your compute the most efficient way possible, there's no better way than batch processing. And today we're going to talk about how to scale Spring Batch. So if you have a, when, like the example I showed uh, in the keynote just a few minutes ago, that was a single threaded job doing one thing, importing one file that wasn't very big into a single table. Not very complex. Let's not kid ourselves, that's not what most of you see in your enterprises. You see much more complex use cases, you've got a lot more things going on and a lot larger volumes of data. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk, we're going to walk through the evolution of Spring, of Spring Batch application. We're going to talk about how you can enhance it by adding the Spring Batch features that allow you to scale. There's five different ways that we'll, we'll talk about. Before we get there, though, about half the hands went up when, I, when they asked who was familiar with Spring Batch. So I'm going to do a quick 101 of Spring Batch lingo so that everybody is uh, kind of comfortable with uh, um, what I'm talking about. Yeah, a funny fact about this slide. So when we generated this tag cloud, uh, have you noticed that the skip word was somehow skipped there? <laughs> so I wonder which kind of AI is used behind the scene, but skipping the word skip. <laughs> uh, anyway. <laughs> cool. Uh, so a job. So you've heard me talk about jobs. Job is the flow that you're going to execute as, as within batch processing. So this may be multiple steps, maybe multiple things that need to happen. But when you kick off a job, the expectation is that there's no additional interaction or interruption until it completes. 
jobs are made up of steps. So a job can have one or many steps. The one I get, used my keynote a minute ago, it only had one step. Uh, the ones we'll be looking at today also only have one step. But you can have multiple steps that transition one to the next to the next. Um, they can be sequential, like I just mentioned. You can have steps that run in parallel, which we'll look at today. Um, you can have uh, all kinds of different configurations, uh, um, uh, conditional steps as well, so where it may or may not run based on some type of logic. Within a step, most spring batch uh, type step types are a tasklet type. So a tasklet is essentially an interface that we provide within Spring Batch. It has a single method on it called execute, and we execute that within the scope of a transaction. The idea being that if you implement the interface yourself, we will handle whatever you do in that transaction, and then you get to choose, do I run this again in a loop, or do I just run it once and move on to the next step? And then we provide a couple custom uh, tasklets. The main one that we'll be talking about today is the uh, chunk-oriented tasklet. So here's where you get chunk processing, which leads me to chunk. A chunk is what it sounds like. It's a chunk of data. So if you want to process, let's say, a million records, you probably don't want to process all those in a single transaction, right? You want to divide those up into smaller transactions and commit along the way. Also maintaining state, so if something fails, you want to be able to go back to the best known state instead of restarting from, from day one. Chunking allows you to do that. So the chunk-oriented tasklet executes a chunk of of the processing in a single transaction. And then it will keep doing that until it essentially runs out of data, and then the step will complete. A chunk is made up of items. So we define the, the chunk size by either hard coding or dynamically providing a, a, a fixed number of items, or there you can uh, implement a strategy that will allow you to dynamically determine the chunk size. But the, the, uh, it's, this is a key point when you're designing your batch applications, um, which is what is an item? You know, if you think of uh, banks have customers that have transactions, is uh, the item the transaction? Is it the customer with a collection of transactions? You know, that kind of art around that is, is probably one of the harder things you have to work out when you're designing your batch jobs. Within a batch application, this is what you might see. So step one, you'll have an item reader, an, an optional item processor, and an item writer. The item reader within the step is responsible for the input of the step. The item processor does whatever processing it is. It takes an item, does something, and returns an item. An item writer is responsible for the output of the step. Now it's important to note, step one is going to start, process, and finish. Then step two will start, process, and finish. Then step three will start, process, and finish. Each one of them going through that loop of reader, processor, writer over and over inside it. Does that make sense? Yeah? Is it possible within a step to parallelize um, any of those things? So for example, start reading chunk two while chunk one is being processed or written? So the question was, is there a way to parallel the, the pieces within a step? So reading and writing? Yep. So we will actually get to that in just a few minutes. There are five different methods to scaling Spring Batch applications. Multi-threaded steps, which is actually what you're asking for. Um, that's where we execute a chunk, each chunk in its own thread. Parallel steps, we run two steps in parallel, or multiple steps in parallel. Uh, async item processor and async item writer. These are two components used in, in conjunction with each other to execute the processing piece of a step in parallel with the reader and writer essentially being synchronous. There's partitioning, which if you're familiar with how that works in, you know, let's say Kafka or, or whatnot, it's pretty much the same concept. And then finally, remote chunking. We're going to walk through all of these in much more detail over the rest of the time. The use case we're going to be doing is really complicated. Uh, we've got some transaction files. We're going to import. We're going to run a batch job that imports them into a database. Um, like I said, really complicated. The idea here, though, is I don't want to focus on the use case or the domain model. I want you to be able to focus on the Spring Batch features themselves. So we'll start off by multi-threaded steps. So with, with a multi-threaded step, what we do is we provide a task, a, a task executor that launches additional threads to the step. And what it will do is it will launch each chunk in its own thread. So when I mentioned earlier the, the, um, the chunk-oriented tasklet and how it, it essentially wraps this execution, so the reader, processor, writer, all of that is wrapped within that chunk-oriented tasklet. Each call to that tasklet is called in its own thread. So that allows you to execute chunks in parallel. 
Now there's some caveats to this, right? Parallel processing typically means you don't get restartability, um, or you, it, you may, depending on how you write the, the writer. Most of our out-of-the-box ones do not support restartability in this particular example. There are other ways to handle this that so we'll get to later that do handle it. Um, but this is by far the easiest and fastest way to scale a Spring Batch application. Let's take a look at an example. So the question was is uh, basically how are the chunks divided based on uh, when you're using this multi-thread model. Um, files are actually a really bad example because files aren't uh, a data model that, that works very well with. Um, uh, it's actually, if you think of a database, uh, that is, is a little more accurate. It's not the way you think, though. What you're, you, so the example you gave was you know, records 1 through 100 would be chunk 1. 101 to 200 would be in chunk two, and those would each be in their own uh, uh, thread. That is not the case with multi-threaded steps. We'll get to a way on how to do that specific thing, but when you're reading with, when you're doing multi-threaded steps, what happens is the reader is going to read um, whatever's the next available. So if I have, let's say, 200 records and I got two threads going, chunk one may be one, five, seven, eight, nine, 15, 20, you know, those are the records, and the other chunk's gonna pick up the other ones. So there's no ordering guaranteed here. It is. So the uh, question is what proportion is being done about the possible database logs when you process steps. So the question was is how, do we, how does the uh, job repository work with multi-threaded steps? Yeah. In most cases, we actually, uh, in our documentation, tell you to turn off the save state piece um, be, for the, that reason. There's, um, most of our readers um, are, not, um, are not threads, well, I shouldn't say most of them. Um, we specifically call out which ones to turn off the state, save state on um, because things like um, reading from a cursor, well, first of all, cursors aren't even uh, thread safe, but um, a lot of the way we keep track of the state of what has been processed is by things like item count. So by doing that, you know, if you have multiple, th multiple threads going at the same time, we, that count may not be accurate. So you turn off the, the save state. The job repository works fine, but you lose restartability. We'll get to more restartable options as in other examples. Go for it. All right. Um, so the application we are going to scale is um, a Spring Boot application. Um, so as Michael described, it will be a Spring Batch job. Can will everybody read that in the back? Is this clear? Readable? Yes. OK, cool. cool. So the input file is uh, this one. So um, it's a pretty big, so I'm going to show you just some records. Yeah. Yeah, so um, we have some transaction data. Uh, this is the account, the amount, and the timestamp, basically. Um, we will read data from this input file and write it in a relational database in this transaction uh, table. So here I have a MySQL running locally on my, uh, my laptop. Um, all right. So here we enable batch processing with this annotation. So we get a handle of the job builder factory and state builder factory to create jobs and steps. Uh, the job definition is this one. So we have a single step, step one. So the step is a chunk-oriented step. Uh, we will read 100 items at a time in a single transaction. We have a reader and a writer. So for uh, the reader is a flat file item reader. So since we are reading data from a flat file. So we give it a name, uh, a resource, which is the input file uh, passed as a job parameter here. It's a delimited file. By default, uh, it's, uh, the delimiter is comma. So we specify the fields we want to uh, map to the domain object transaction here. We have the account, amount, and timestamp, and how to map those fields to the domain object. 
basically the format of the data and so on. That's for reading. For writing, um, we use a JDBC batch item writer. So uh, we, we provide the data source, which is uh, configured automatically <laughs> by Spring Boot according to the properties I have here in my, my uh, properties file. So it points to the local host. Um, so we give it the data source, the um, SQL statement. So in this case, it's an insert in the transaction uh, table for these fields. And we basically say, get those fields from uh, the transaction pojo. Sorry. Is there a way to provide SQL in a file that So the question is, can you uh, provide the SQL in a file? Yeah, you'd use regular Spring Boot uh, property injection. So anything you anything you do with regular property injection with, with Spring, Spring, frankly, Spring Framework, you can do that. OK, so this is for writing. Um, and that's it for the step. So by default, this step will run in a single thread. In order to make it a, a multi-threaded step, all we need to do is to add a task executor here. Task executor. Uh, task executor is an interface from um, Spring Framework. Um, and we can use uh, whatever implementation we want. So for instance, here I'm going to use a thread pool task executor to reuse threads with four threads. And that's it. So let's run the app. So the input file contains um, 60,000 records, I guess. So let's see. Yeah. So I'm expecting to have 60,000 records uh, in the transaction table. It's done. So the job is finished here. Let's take a look at how many records we have here and 60,000 records. So that's it for multi-threaded steps. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. The second option in scaling Spring Batch applications is parallel steps. So here you have two single-threaded, typically, it doesn't have to be, uh, steps, they're just completely unrelated, but they have to be done before something else. So let's say I've got um, uh, a, a, a store import and a customer import. There's no referential integrity between them. I just need to get both files imported into my database before I run some type of aggregation later on down the line. I can run those in parallel instead of sequentially and speed, up, speed it up, obviously. Um, here's an example of what it would look like. So you've got step one. Step two and three will, will execute in parallel. Um, it should be noted by default, Spring Batch will not execute them in parallel. You have to provide a task executor that will do this for you. Um, by default, we use the synchronous task executor, really because there's no other good default. Um, it's, otherwise, we'd just be kind of randomly saying, eh, four sounds good for threads, which it just isn't a good default. Um, so you provide a task executor that will execute these in threads, um, and then all sides of this need to execute and finish before the job continues. So if I had, let's say, um, instead of one over here, let's say I had two steps that had ran in a sequence and one step over here, both of the ones on this side and the one on this side would have to complete before the step after those continues on. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. So in order to show you how um, parallel steps work in, pra work in practice, let's clean the database. Uh, you're still on. Oh, sorry. There you Uh, so uh, in this case, we are going to read data from two different files. Uh, one is, is a CSV file, the one we, uh, we, we saw earlier, and another file, which is an XML file. Uh, the XML file looks like this. Uh, let's take a look. So um, big transaction. Yeah. So basically, it's, uh, we have the same transaction data, but in XML format. So we have a tag per transaction. We have the account, the amount, and timestamp. 
Um, so uh, in this case, we are going to create two different steps, uh, step one and step two, and we want to make those run in parallel. Um, step one is the same as we saw earlier, so same reader and writer. Um, the reader will read data from the input flat file. And step two is exactly the same except the reader here, which is a XML, uh, it's a stacks event item reader to read the XML data. So we give it a name, a resource, which is uh, the input XML file passed as a job parameter. Uh, here we pass both files as parameters to the job. Um, we need to specify the tag name, the root element name. Um, here on our domain object, we have XML root element. We are going to use a uh, JAXB and Marshaller to mar and Marshall uh, transaction data into this object. And we specify the and Marshaller here. That's it. Now, if you want to run these two steps uh, in sequence, uh, we would write something like this. So we create a job. We start with step one, and then we run step two. So those will run in sequence. But in this case, we want to run a parallel flow. So in order to do that, we will create a parallel flow. So this is the flow API from Spring Batch. So this parallel flow uh, will start with step one, and then we split the flow using a task executor to, to run each step in parallel uh, with, this, uh, with a different thread. And when we split the flow, we add the second flow, and the second flow uh, will execute step two. So we start with step one, split the flow, step two, and we run them on in parallel. So we build the flow, and the job will, of course, run the parallel flow. And this is how uh, step one and step two will run in parallel uh, in two different uh, threads, thanks to this task executor here. All right, so let's run the app. I'm going to clean up the database. So as you can see here, uh, we have step one and step two running in parallel in two different threads. Okay. Um, the input file, uh, the CSV one, is the same uh, as we saw uh, before. It contains 60,000 records. Um, this file, the XML file, let's check quickly how many records tags in there. So I'm going to do something like grep count transaction tag in the big transaction XML file. It should be fine. So we have 110,000 uh, tags. So I'm expecting to have a total of 170,000 records in the transaction table when the job is finished. So it should shortly finish. Here we go. So the job is completed. Cool. Let's check the database. And we have uh, 100, 170,000 records in there. So that's how we run two uh, steps in parallel uh, within uh, a job. Awesome. Yeah. Is it important to use the same types when your jobs? So the question was, is it important to, to write thread safe types when writing your jobs? Uh, when you say writing thread safe types, do you mean the item itself or the other components that Batch uses? The job components themselves? Yeah, yeah those, um, it depends. It depends on what you want to use them for. I, yeah, thread safety is a good thing to, to aspire for, but um, uh, quite frankly, not all of the uh, readers, uh, for example, in Spring Batch are thread safe. The cursor one isn't. Uh, the JDBC cursor one isn't, but that's because a data source in, in Java isn't thread safe. So there's nothing we can do about that. Um, so, you know, it really depends on your use case. Obviously, you do the best you can, and, and um, you know, use those components in the right in the right manner. There are ways to use uh, threading within Spring Batch, and there's ways to do parallelization without using threads. Um, that you can also take advantage of, like I said, those parallel mechanisms without having to get into those. Um, 
So the question was, is how does uh, Spring Batch know where in the file it is? Is that fair? Yeah, which chunk we need to take by one thread is taking this yep, chunk yep. So the so the readers are stateful. So it opens up the file at the, at, when uh, the step starts, and then it's reading from that a, a single input stream. All the threads are hitting that same input stream if, in a file case. Um, in, a in a database uh, situation, you'd be hitting the same uh, result set. Um, you know, or or it, there are some nuances to that. Um, but yeah, so it's really dependent on the implementation. Other questions? Yeah. Is there any way to parallelize reading from the same file? Excellent question. So the question was, is, is there a way to parallelize reading from the same file? We've looked into it um, quite a bit, actually. There was actually a pull request open probably about three years ago now um, where somebody w tried doing that with offsets and whatnot. Um, we never accepted that pull request because um, it was our fear that uh, a lot of people see more threads equals faster, I'll go with that one. And all of our benchmarks said that they were, it was a, a wash. Sometimes it was faster, sometimes it wasn't. It was very hardware specific. Um, we'd love to, if somebody was interested in, in, in contributing back and working with us on that uh, idea again, we'd be open to it. Um, but based on the hardware we have access to and that we were able to try it out with, I couldn't get a definitive, you know, you need this, you know, these are the check boxes you need to check in order to make that faster, and I just saw Stack Overflow blowing up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very. So the question was, uh, how does basically uh, Spark's able to do it and why it can't batch? <laughs> um, so Spark has um, a much more dedicated infrastructure than batch does. Batch will run on commodity uh, uh, hardware. You don't have Spark, you've got to set up a special cluster for. Um, it handles a lot more things at a much lower level than Spring Batch does. Spring Batch goes directly through more regular Java APIs for a lot of the stuff, or Spark doesn't. Um, yeah, uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, there are other ways to gain performance that is uh, similar to Spark from a reading perspective uh, with Spring Batch, just not here's a one big massive file, do it that way. Um, when you think of how most Spark uh, jobs run, they typically run on, on HDFS, right? Well, that by nature is a distributed file system. That's not what we're talking about here. If you throw Spring Batch with a partition job against a, a distributed file system, you could see read numbers that, were, that are, are in the same ballpark. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, we have, we've tried some things where you can single file. Okay. It has been pretty much regular hardware that we've done anything else with. So, okay. I was just curious about it. Yeah, and, and again, I'd be interested, if, like I said, I'm, I'm looking for that list of checkboxes to, to identify what that hardware is, because uh, just doing the same thing on a laptop, for example, it's actually slower, um, for example. So. So the question was, if you've got a file, let's say a few gigs, do you have to be able to fit that whole thing in your, in your uh, heap space, right? So with this chunking model, the only things that are kept in the heap are the items that are currently within that chunk. So if I've got, let's say I've got a file that's you know, 10 gigs large, if my chunk size is 100 uh, records and that's only, let's say, 100K, I only have 100K sitting in, my, in heap at a time. But the file is reading the whole file. But it's an, in, it's an input, uh, it's an, uh, uh, input stream, so it's only pulling data off as it needs it. It's, Java doesn't, when you open up an input stream, load everything into memory, otherwise no Java app would work. <laughs> so you will have at most a chunk size item in your heap and not the whole file. This is the idea of chunk processing, chunk per chunk. All good stuff. Anything else before moving on? Cool. Async item processor and async item writer. So. Most batch processes are I.O. bound. So the, the, the bottleneck in batch processing is typically how fast can I get stuff off disk? How fast can I get stuff across a network to a database? Those kinds of things are typically the bottleneck in a batch process. However, that isn't always the case. So this offers an example of how to parallelize the processing piece of it. The processing piece here, what happens is you take your normal item processor. So Let's say I've got, uh, using the example uh, from Riff, uppercase. So I want to uppercase a string, for example. 
For each item that goes through that, um, the item writer is decorated with the async item, uh, or, I'm sorry, the item process, your custom item processor is decorated with ours, and ours is going to launch that item processor in a separate thread. So for each item, I'll launch a separate thread. Obviously, you can use thread pulls and that kind of stuff, um, just for the processing piece. The item processor, instead of returning the result of the, the, the transformation, returns a future. The future is then passed to the item writer, and the item writer will then call future.get for each one, getting the values out and writing them as they return. That makes sense? It's important to note that you do have to use the, item, the async item processor and async item writer together, because otherwise you'd have to unwrap your own futures in the writer piece. Let's take a look at that. Yeah, so let's see it in action. <coughs> Think. Um, so in this demo, uh, we are going to reuse the same file uh, reader and writer, and we will add an item processor here to simulate some processing on each transaction. Um, let's imagine the processing takes five milliseconds. So we were going to simulate that with uh, thread.sleep, five milliseconds. So uh, by default, the processing, so the item processor, will run in the main thread. Uh, and what we want to do is to offload this processing to a separate thread. So in order to do that, we are going to wrap, um, to use, to wrap our processor into a async item processor. So um, this async item processor uh, will have our regular processor as a delegate and we need to set a task executor uh, in order to uh, execute the processing in a separate thread. So as Michael described, this async item processor will return a future of the processing result coming from our regular processor here. Now this future uh, needs to be unwrapped uh, to get the actual processing result and then written, uh, written uh, using the item writer. And this is the role of the async item writer. So the async item writer uh, will have as a delegate our uh, regular writer. Uh, it will unwrap the future and then pass it to our regular writer to write it to the database. So uh, important to mention, as Michael uh, said, uh, these two components should be used together in order to do the processing and writer asynchronously. So now, now that we have defined these two uh, guys, we can use them in the step uh, here, processor, async, item processor and writer async item writer. So we use them instead of the regular, regular ones. The input file is the same. So um, let's run the app. So five milliseconds times 60,000 records, how long is yeah. that? So if you do the math, uh, that should take about five minutes. Um, sequentially. Sequ yeah, sequentially without the uh, async item processor and writer. Right. Here. Um, the job is running. I hear the fan going. <laughs> so it should uh, finish shortly. Is that a new feature? Yeah, yeah, nope. Uh, so the question was, is this a new feature? It's not new, but it was kind of hidden for many years. Um, so there was a separate project called Spring Batch Admin for a while. Um, we've since uh, sunsetted that in favor of Spring Cloud Dataflow. Uh, but this and another component we're going to show in a, in a bit, um, at the time that project, at the time these were created, that project was iterating faster, so we kind of dumped it over there so we could get it out faster. Um, it wasn't until Spring Batch 3 that we brought that stuff over. So the question was, is, is this still processing chunks? Yeah, so the chunk concept still uh, applies. So we're still processing one transaction, 100 records. The only thing we're parallelizing is the transformation piece, that processor piece. That's the only thing that we're changing here. So how fast did it run? Uh, I'm just uh, going to rerun it. Yeah. Why we, uh... So the question was, does this work with the flat file item writer? Yeah, because the item writer in this case is not impacted in any way. So the question was, is there an ideal range for a chunk size? It's very use case specific. Uh, 
So how big, how big of a box you're running on, how much cheap space you have, how big your items are. Uh, I'd love to say X, but yeah. So the question was, is, uh, is there an empirical way of determining what that chunk size should be? Uh, benchmarking. Get to it in ju just one sec. Go ahead and. Yeah. So uh, as we said, instead of five minutes, uh, the job took 35 seconds. So that's a huge difference, I guess, between uh, synchronous processing uh, and asynchronous processing. We can run the five minute version if you want. <laughs> there was a question in the back. So the question was, is there any consideration or concerns about uh, transaction boundaries with, with these async processes? All of these async processes are still within the boundary of a transaction. Nothing spans the boundary of a single transaction. A chunk is what defines the uh, transaction uh, um, boundaries. And all of these things that we've shown so far are within the size of one chunk. Sorry, somebody was coughing. I missed the. Does it anyway take back to the overall transaction boundary of the job itself? So does it, uh, does it tie back to the overall transaction boundary of the job itself? The job itself doesn't have a transaction boundary. There is no global transaction for an entire job. If you want to roll back something, let's say a job failed and you need to roll back all of the work, all of the chunks within a, a job, you need to implement uh, compensating controls for that as opposed to just roll back a global transaction kind of thing. Other questions on that? That's been the easy stuff. Um, so up to now, though, everything we've talked about so far is thread-based, single JVM. I think we all are aware that not everything fits nicely into a nice, simple J single JVM. There are just workloads that just need more processing power, whether it be more I.O., more compute, et cetera. Partitioning is one of the first two options that we have for both within a single JVM as well as remote uh, partitioning for multi-JVM. Here we have a master worker configuration. So the master has two key components, a partitioner and a partition handler. The partitioner is responsible for understanding your data and how to divide it up. So if I've got, let's say, a directory of files, the partitioner may say I create a partition per file. If I'm looking at a database table, it may look at uh, a key and, and you know, partition based on those keys. Um, the partition handler is responsible for communicating the metadata about each partition to the workers. So um, if I'm doing files and I'm doing a partition per file, it'll say you work on partition number one, you work on file number two, you work on file number three, and so on. It's important to note that in this model, we're only sending metadata over the wire if we're using remote partitioning. The partitioner, we provide one out of the box. It's a file-based one. You throw out a directory of... Uh, uh, or an uh, expression of, of resources, and we create a partition per resource. It's a simple interface. It's really easy to, to do just about anything else you'd need. The partition handler, there's actually three options, two within Spring Batch and one within Spring Cloud Task. The two within Spring Batch are a thread-based one, which is the task executor partition handler, and a Spring integration-based one, which is the message channel partition handler. That one uses uh, Spring integration channels to communicate between the master and worker. The third option, which is provided via Spring Cloud Task, is the deployer partition handler. Here, uh, backing up, so the thread-based one will launch threads inside a JVM, that's normal. The message channel one, your workers have to be read, already running, waiting for that work before we send it. Or you can use durable hardware and it'll be sitting there waiting when you bring them up. But it's not going to do the processing until those workers are, are there. Um, you're responsible for orchestrating the workers, I should say. The third one with Spring Cloud Task and the Deployer Partition Handler is it will launch the workers dynamically for you on a platform. So if you want to run this on Cloud Foundry, you can configure it to launch the workers as tasks at runtime. So let's say I need, I've got five files, I need five partitions, I need five workers. It will dynamically launch five workers. They'll launch, they'll run, and they'll shut back down, giving you that cloud elasticity that we've been looking for. <coughs> 
So the question was, is the, um, does the partitioner, uh, basically the master, have to be running the whole time? It has to be running the whole time the workers are running. Um, so, because it's going to keep, because this is a single step. If you had steps before and after, it could be, and it's not going to uh, advance until all the workers are done anyways. Um, so there's that, the master is responsible for that aggregation of did all my workers complete or not. Um, I was going to say something else. Oh, uh, the deployer partition handler. Uh, it does, you can also configure it with a high watermark. So if you have, um, you know, the example I used in my keynote a few minutes ago, if I dump a thousand files at it, you may not want to launch a thousand tasks all at once. Somebody might get mad at you for that. So we can actually configure what's the max, and then it'll work through and keep basically that same amount busy until it's gotten through them all. So the question was, is will it, can you uh, partition a monolithic file? Um, the, question, the answer is no. You'd have to split it yourself. You can use command line stuff like literally OSX split works fast. And I mean, I've seen plenty of jobs do that. They'll have step one, split file, step two, partition file, that kind of thing. Um, and it's important to note with partitioning, one of the nice, get one sec. Um, with partitioning, restartability all works nicely. Each one of the partitions, uh, each one of the workers is its own independent step. State is managed at each one. For if any one of them fail and all the others finish, when you restart the job, just the ones that failed will be reprocessed. None of the other ones will be will be taken uh, reprocessed. Yeah. How in the world do you test that? How do you test which like that this? Yeah. So the question was, how do you test this? Uh, any specific piece or in general or? Well, like we struggled really hard on figuring out how to test the checkpoint restart pieces. Um, you know, trying to get the thing to fail in the middle of the test was very difficult. Now you're taking that difficult piece and trying to split it across multiple partitions and see if everything works the way that it does. Mm -hmm. it's supposed to. I mean, mm -hmm. Does spring test allow you to bring up this instance and test it, or I mean, how do you test that? So these, so basically, is how, how do you test uh, like restartability for, for this? Each one of these bottom workers is no different than if we were to take this and drop it in that stop that top spot and just let it run in part of your job. So testing these is exactly the same as you would test it if it was part of a regular job. The orchestration piece, yeah, there's a little extra work there. Um, you, you'll see how my mood uh, uh, bootstraps things. Um, actually, it'd be interesting to open up uh, a couple issues to talk about ways we can maybe help out with that. Yeah, maybe after the talk I can show you. Uh, we will be running uh, multiple workers and a master step, and then uh, it's uh, just killing one of the workers and see how the master will handle the situation. So if you want, after the talk I can show you uh, how it works. So we're going to be demoing remote partitioning. So. If you're familiar with Spring integration or the integration enterprise pat or enter enterprise integration patterns, these icons should look familiar. If you're not, I'm sorry. Um, but so basically, the way this flow works is you've got the master and the worker. Obviously, you have one master, many workers. Um, we start off with the partition handler because remember I said that was responsible for communicating to the workers what to process. So going across the top, we it sends out request messages to an outbound adapter. The adapter is connected to Rabbit in our case. So Rabbit will spend, send the stuff background to the inbound adapter at the top of the worker, goes into a channel which goes to a service activator, which executes the remote step. The remote step is a, a standard spring batch step. It logs its state to the job repository, all those kinds of things. The remote step then says, hey, I'm done. And the service activator is going to send a message back through the replies, the outbound adapter uh, over Rabbit, back to the inbound adapter where it sits in a staging queue. We then use an aggregator basically waiting for all of the stuff to, all of the other steps to, to complete, and then we'll release it once they all come through. And the partition handler will say yes or no, it passed or failed. The return trip of this is optional. We also uh, support the ability for you to pull the job repository. Since the workers are maintaining their state in the job repository, you can just pull that as well if you don't want to have the, round, the, the trip back. Let's take a look. All right. Yeah, over here. So the question was, uh, can you customize the metadata coming back to the uh, master? Uh, you can, but 
Um, there's some constraints about um, uh, how that's promoted and whatnot. It, it, let's talk about that one off offline. Yep. Yeah, so typically um, the question was is what happens if the work, a worker fails and let's say it doesn't send a response. Um, so typically the aggregator will have a timeout. You know, and it'll say, and you can even configure it, um, uh, send, uh, oh, what's the property? Send incomplete results or partial results, something along those lines. It, it'll send those along and then the master will say, hey, I didn't get all my stuff back. The, the step is a failure. Only for that particular worker, not for job. Right, right. Well, so if a step fails, the job is considered failed anyways. So then when it starts back up, it'll start back up at that partition step, assuming that's the way you configured it. It'll start at that step and it'll only run, rerun the partitions that, that failed. Go for it. All right. Um, so for this demo of remote partitioning, uh, we are going to read data from three different files. Um, and for each file, we are going to create a partition. Um, as Michael described, we have a master worker configuration. So here I have um, one configuration class for the master and another one for the worker. Um, the first thing to do is to define the um, round trip between the master and the worker, as we saw on the, ski on the diagram. Uh, so basically, on the master side, we have two flows, uh, an outbound flow going from the master to workers, and an inbound flow from the workers um, to the master. So using Spring integration, this is uh, pretty much easy to, uh, to implement. We have uh, a channel called requests, and an outbound adapter, which will take messages from this uh, request channel and uh, send them on the request queue on RabbitMQ. So here I have a RabbitMQ running locally uh, on my laptop and I have defined two queues, uh, request and replies. So this is the outbound flow from the master to workers. Now the inbound flow coming from workers, we have a channel called re replies and an integration flow, uh, so we have an inbound adapter which will take messages from the uh, RabbitMQ queue called replies and put them on this replies channel. So this abstract, uh, the way we communicate with, the, uh, with the RabbitMQ, we can change it, change it to GMS if you want. So this is another level of uh, abstraction. So now that we define the outbound flow and inbound flow on the master side, uh, we need to define the partitioner. Uh, here we are going to use the multi-resource partitioner. This guy takes um, a bunch of files. Uh, here we are passing them as a job parameter. So uh, here are the files. So we have a white card that will take all these files here. And we'll create a uh, partition per file. And the key will be um, file. Now, in, in order to glue all these pieces together, uh, what we added in uh, Spring Batch 4.1 uh, is a remote partitioning master step builder. Uh, this uh, is available in the uh, application context if we use a new annotation called enable batch integration. So this is to enable the integration uh, piece uh, in Spring Batch. So once we have this, uh, actually this help building a master step in a remote partitioning setup. So if you think about it, on the master side, all I have to do is to say, here is how I partition data, here is how I create partition, uh, where should I send the request to workers, and where should I get the replies? So I can specify my partitioner, and the name of the worker step that will be executed on the worker side, an output channel from the master to the workers. It's an output channel, so it's requests, uh, requests here, and an input channel on which we will go, uh, receive the replies. So this is a master step. Um, the, the, the builder will, behind the scene, create the uh, partition handler that Michael described, which is the um, message channel partition handler. Uh, before Spring uh, Batch 4.1, we had to uh, configure this manually. So with this new builder, uh, it's created automatically. So it's a bit declarative. I am a master step. 
here is how I partition data. Uh, I want to send requests on this channel and get replies on that channel. And that's it. Now on the worker side, uh, things are pretty much similar. We have to define an inbound flow coming from the master and an outbound flow going to the master. So the uh, inbound flow, uh, so those are requests coming on this channel, an inbound adapter uh, from the uh, rabbit queue. And to send replies back to the, uh, to the master, uh, we have a replies channel and an outbound adapter to the replies queue on RabbitMQ. So those are uh, the flows. Now on the worker side, um, as we said, we execute a step. So it's a spring batch step. Uh, we created another uh, builder. Uh, so this time it's called Remote Partitioning Worker Step Builder. So this guy will create, uh, will simplify creation of a worker step. So on the worker side, what we need to specify is where do I get the requests from master? Where do I send the replies to the master? And then I define the step uh, as usual. So it's a chunk oriented step with 100 items, the reader, uh, the processor, and the writer that we saw earlier. So for the demo, I'm going to use uh, two spring profiles, master and uh, uh, worker. Uh, let's see how it works. So I'm going to uh, launch a couple of workers. So here I have commands. Uh, so the question was, is, is so good. Yeah. So um, the question is, uh, is it mandatory to use these profiles? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, we can create two different jars, uh, one for the master and another one for uh, the worker. And then you can run just a Spring Boot app. Uh, here, it's just for convenience, one jar, and we use, it, we use the same jar for workers and master. Just a matter of. Uh, it's also not uncommon to have the worker or the master also be a worker. Since it's just waiting while the other workers are processing, it can also be participating in the work. All right, so here I'm going to run a first worker. Sorry, uh, there's a question. Another question. There's a question. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so the question is, uh, what happens uh, if a new file arrives when the master is already uh, started? Okay. Um, uh, normally, when you start the job and the master starts creating the partitions, uh, it's already done. So partitions are already defined. We know the files. So if you have another file coming after creating these partitions, I think uh, you need to uh, start another instance of the job. Otherwise, you use another mechanism of listening uh, to uh, the input directory and then creating one partition on the fly. Uh, yeah, that needs to be done uh, differently. The reason for that is restartability. We need the, the uh, data set to be immutable um, once the partitions are started. So if we were able to ingest that kind of stuff, that means the data set could be changing at any time. Now, granted, you still have to do some things like if you're processing if files is the easy one where you can just move them out of the way or just, just we, you know what the file names are. But let's say database records, for example. You know, if, you, if that's changing between runs, you, you do something like a listener to flag, you know, these are the ones that are being processed and that kind of thing. Yeah, usually for batch processing, the data set we work on is fixed. Uh, otherwise, it becomes streaming. It's the same uh, issue happens when you write a batch job, for instance, that reads item from a queue. So let's imagine you start the job, it reads some um, messages from the queue, and then another message comes in. So this kind of input is not uh, fixed. So normally uh, for the file case, uh, you should operate on a single uh, file set so that when you restart the job, you have the same job parameter and you can uh, reprocess the failed file, for instance. So here I started a uh, first worker, I'm going to Start another worker. So these two workers are waiting for work. Um, and now uh, a master. So as you can see here, so the master sent um, messages to workers, and workers are processing transaction data. Um, 
So here, the imp uh, the imp each input file, uh, what is the each input input file contains twenty thousand records. So we are expecting to have uh, sixty thousand records uh, in the database after the job is finished. So it looks like workers have finished. Yeah, and the job is completed. So let's check how many records we have here. Oops. 60,000 records. So all partitions were uh, processed. Um, if you noticed, we have three partitions since we have three files, but only two workers. I, I launched only two workers, so one of the workers uh, processed two files. And the master then aggregates uh, aggregated the replies from these workers and finished uh, the job execution. Um, one maybe important thing to show is in this case, uh, if we take a look at how many steps have been executed, we have uh, four step execution. So one for, for the master and three for each uh, partition. So each one uh, read and written 20,000 records. Cool. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Is there a way you can dynamically start the number of workers? So the question was, is there a way to dynamically start the number of rec workers? That would be using the, um, uh, on, a, on a platform you can with the, the deployer partition handler. That, what it actually does is it will, once the, the, that partition handler piece, so once the partitions have been figured out, okay, I need five partitions, it, it tells the partition handler, and the partition handler will then launch Let's say if I need five partitions, I'll launch five workers. Or Kubernetes, yeah. Yeah, yeah those are two that are supported. Yeah. And, and when you do that, when you choose a question, you would want, you want to have, use the same jar for everything, the same package. You would then use profiles to distinguish between each row. You got it, you got it. And actually, I'm, I'm not going to put you on the spot to do it, but I think uh, you should be able to do on when you run your commands. Um, you should be able to on that master one do master comma worker, and it would launch. It would yeah. that the master one would serve it both as a master and a worker. I'm so not going to put you in the spot to do that live. We can we can do that. <laughs> no worries. But uh, indeed, uh, when, when, while the workers are working, the master is sitting there uh, doing nothing. We can use the master as a worker at the same time, right. and this is a very good point indeed. So what does what shutdowns the workers? Uh, in this model, it's up to you. It's your problem. That's the, that's the benefit of running this on a platform with the deployer partition handler, because it launches them in a platform native way that, that they automatically shut down. So on Cloud Foundry, it runs them as tasks, which basically once the JVM is done, it shuts down. Um, on Kubernetes, they're run as, I forget if it's bare pods or jobs. I know we, they, we were bare pods, and I think we were going to switch back to jobs. Um, but in either case, they shut down once the processing is done. Uh, it's also possible to shut down the worker uh, with a listener. So once the step is done, you say, look, uh, I'm finished. Uh, we can uh, shut down the JVM. Yeah. In the back. Yeah, so the question is how the master knows uh, how many workers are there and how do they finish, basically. Okay, so when we create the partitions, we know how many partitions we created, right? So we will send, uh, behind the scene, we will send messages and we have a correlation ID. So we know how many workers are there and so we know how many replies we are expecting. So uh, if one of the workers uh, fails, uh, the master will time out and say, look, uh, I started three partitions, only two uh, have been processed. The other guy is not here, so I fail after one hour, for instance. Is that time out configurable? Yes. It's configurable on the uh, messaging template that you use to send uh, the requests. Yeah, sorry, the question was, is that timeout uh, configurable? Uh, and the answer is yes. Cool. The last option. So partition, remote partitioning is great for general use cases, it's especially places where you're I.O. bound. Um, but sometimes you need uh, additional processing power, uh, but in, beyond a single JVM. This is where remote chunking comes into play. So here, we have a, it's still a master worker configuration, 
The master has a regular item reader, and then it has a special item writer. The item writer, what it does is it's going to actually write out, instead of writing out metadata about what to process, it's going to send the actual data over the wire to the workers. The workers are then going to pick the, that work up, and then it'll do the processing, and then it can either write locally or send a message back to the master to be written all there. It's important to note that this is a very IO intensive op option, so it's only useful when processing is the bottleneck. That's why partitioning is by far used more frequently. But there are use cases where if processing is the, the bottleneck, this comes in really handy. Unlike part remote partitioning, um, where you do not have to use durable uh, middleware in between the master and the worker, because the job repository takes care of um, lost messages and that kind of thing in deduping, uh, this case, because you're sending the actual data over the wire, you do need durable messaging middleware in between the master and the worker. So what does this flow look like? So this kind of ends up at the uh, chunk messaging uh, channel item writer. That's that special item writer. So it's going to send a message to the request, outbound adapter, over rabbit, inbound adapter, request, service activator. Most of this should sound relatively familiar. Uh, it's the same basic flow. The only difference now is instead of sending metadata over the wire, we're sending the actual data over the wire. You also notice there's no aggregation on the reply side on the master because all the writing in our case, we're doing it at the worker level, so there's nothing to aggregate. Let's take a look at this in action. Yes. Yeah. Can you do a sync process in the partitioning of chunk? <laughs> so can you uh, basically, can you run the async item processor and item writer in remote chunking? You can. Um, at yeah, I'm, yeah, you can. Um, and actually, now that, although I laughed, now that I think about it, uh, depending on what your processing is, it may actually make sense, depending on the size of the workers and whatnot. So yeah. Just like in a partition job, you can also have that be a multi-threaded step inside the, each worker, for example. All right, so um, for remote chunking, um, we are going to configure the same uh, round trip between the master and uh, the worker. So here I have two configuration classes. So let's start with the master side. Uh, let's make this thing a bit bigger. So on the master side, uh, the same flow request outbound adapter to the request queue on Rabbit, uh, replies inbound adapter from the replies queue on Rabbit. Um, so as Michael described, on the master side, we are going to read data and send the data over the wire um, to, to, to the workers. So all we have to uh, specify on the master side is a reader. So I am going to reuse the same uh, flat file item reader. And just like for remote partitioning master set builder we saw, here we have remote chunking master set builder. So this guy can be injected if we have the enable batch integration annotation. Um, added. So on the master side, um, we have a chunk oriented step. So we, uh, we read data using this reader. We send requests on this output channel and we are expecting replies on this input channel. So if we think about it, that's all we need on the master side. Read the data, send it over the wire. On the worker side, um, always the same Inbound flow and outbound flow for requests and replies. I'm not going to repeat those. Um, the thing, uh, the, um, on the worker side for remote chunking, we don't have a spring batch step. So uh, you can think about them as just regular um, message listeners. Uh, we get a chunk request with the items we have to uh, process. We process them and send chunk uh, replies. So there is no spring batch knowledge on the worker side. Uh, that's why for the worker, we don't have a step. We have only an integration flow. And for, to create this integration flow, we have this builder uh, called um, Remote Chunking Worker Builder. Note there is no step in this, uh, the name of this builder. It, there is no step. So um, the integration flow is um, 
um, is defined uh, like this. So we have um, the input channel on which we get requests from the master, the output channel on which we send replies, and then what, what do we do for each chunk uh, request? So we have to define an item processor and writer, but we, yeah, actually we can use an item processor and writer, but we don't have to. You can use any other API. Here we are using Spring Batch as a library if you want, just if we have already defined the processor and the writer, we can reuse them, but we can use any kind of uh, processing on the, the worker side. So the processor is uh, s simply a processing transaction here, and we are going to print an, uh, statement on the console and the writer is the one which will uh, write data to the database. Uh, as Michael said, it's important that um, the queues on RabbitMQ uh, here are durable so that if we, um, if one of the workers fail, uh, the data is not lost, is, is not lost, so it will stay on RabbitMQ and another worker can, can take it. Uh, that's it, so let's see how it works. Um, While he's bringing those up, yeah, the um, function of restartability in partitioning is because of the state management in the job repository. Restart ab the ability for um, remote chunking to restart is based on the fact that your data is sitting in a, in a persistent queue. So I started a first worker here and a second worker here, and now I'm going to start a master. All right. So as we see here, data is being sent over the wire and workers are getting uh, transaction items and processing the chunks. All right, so it looks like the job is finished. Uh, here the input file is uh, this one, remote chunking. Yeah, it contains 10,000 records. Let's see quickly if, if I remember. Mm. Not going to do that. It's better on the command line, <laughs> 10,000 records. So um, let's see if we have them there. And we have 10,000 records. Um, and that's it. Yeah, so one of the question was, uh, what if the worker, one if, uh, what if one of the workers uh, fail for the master? Um, for the, for, uh, what if one of the workers fail on the remote partitioning side? Uh, we said that when we restart the job, uh, only the partition uh, that failed will be restarted. For remote chunking, since we send the data, if uh, one of the worker, uh, workers fail, the message that was taken by this worker will be sent back to RabbitMQ, so we don't lose the data, and another worker will uh, pick it up and uh, process the chunk request. So it's a bit different than remote partitioning. Uh, that's why we need a durable uh, uh, middleware for remote chunking. Cool. That's it. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Yep. It does. So doesn't that become huge then? Implementation, like, so you guys are using RabbitMQ, you guys are using some other new JMAX or some other queue mechanism, don't you now depend on that transactionality? We require that, it, so the question is, does, do we depend on, on the queue to be transactional? And the answer is yes, we do. Um, the so batch, you only support transactional queue mechanisms for? If you want restartability. Otherwise, if, you're, if, in between, if a worker fails and you're content clearing out the queues and starting over again, you can do that. So those are, those are your two options. Either you, ha you have you support queuing mechanisms that are transactional and that you can that we can do a, a true rollback with, or not. And if you don't, that means you're going to have to uh, do some cleanup in between to do a restart. Great. Can you get an XA transaction then between the message queue and the data persistence store? You can. It's we all we know we know yeah we all know yeah. 
Yeah. So yeah. The, the question was, is, uh, can you use XA transactions for, for on the workers so that, that everything's in sync? Yes, you can. Yeah. Go ahead and back to the slides. So Apache Camel is closer. Uh, the question is, what's the difference between Apache Camel and this? This uh, Apache Camel is a closer uh, relation to uh, Spring integration than than this. Um, it's more messaging and, and the adapters and the enterprise integration patterns. That's Spring integration, not Spring Batch. Yeah. Carry it. So the question is, is Batch still relevant in a cloud uh, native architecture? Yes, definitely. Uh, there are plenty of use cases that batch processing makes sense. Blah, blah. This is just the conclusion. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>